I'm going to make a bit of a bold statement. Every day I love him more. Every day I love him more because as I get to know him, I want to know more. Not of what so much he can do, but who he is. So, good afternoon. Family and, uh, whoops, it's good to be back. Last week I was, I had the privilege of going to a service at a different church um, for an ordination. And uh, I rang someone on the way home and they said you were just buzzing (laughs) because the presence of God was electric and it was a great service. But it's great to be back here today. So today we're going to dive into the magnificent book of Romans and specifically I'm going to focus on Romans 8.14 which says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I'm wanting to try and start to unpack this today. The power of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And this is, I think, the first of at least one more message that the Lord has put on my heart to share it was interesting because as I was, re- as I was preparing for this here, he was leading me into the other scripture in Galatians that says, led by the Spirit. And I'm thinking, okay, which one do you want me to have, Lord? He says, this one first. <laughs> this one first. And then we'll see. So why am I sharing it? It's so that, well, it's on my heart to share it in preparation of his bride. And we are his bride, are we not? Amen. So, I'm going to start with a quote. D.L. Moody once said, I believe firmly that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride, selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's word the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our law, of our hearts. And I believe this quote perfectly aligns with what we'll be looking at today. So let's prepare ourselves to hear what Jehovah is saying to us by being spiritually open. So let's pray. Jehovah, we thank you for the incredible gift of your word, which is unfailing truth and continuously relevant to every one of us every single day of the year. We ask that you open our spiritual eyes, ears and hearts to truly understand the power, the guidance and the comfort of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us, lead us, direct us, comfort us and bring revelation to us as we delve into your word. For, Lord, we want to know you better in your fullness. We know the Father, we know the Son, but we need to know the Holy Spirit too because he is part of who you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read to you. Originally, I was just going to stay with the one verse. But God said, now you better give a bit of context here, Janet. Good idea. So Romans 8, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, 
you will die. But if you if by the spirit, but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of body, you live. Therefore, brothers and sisters, oh, you live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. So from the beginning of this chapter, there was the comparison between those that are living in the flesh and those of Christ who are to be spirit-led, spirit people. But let's take a step back for a moment and look at why we need to not only be filled with the Holy Spirit but also led by the Spirit and there's a difference. And a quote from Andrew Murray and he states, Every Christian must learn to be led by the Spirit. What does it mean? First, why is being filled with and led by the Spirit so crucial to every Christian. He wrote this years ago, centuries ago, but it's still very, very much relevant to today. So as I said, our focal point for today is Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, these are the sons of God. Very specific, isn't it? And I thought, hmm, okay, let's see what comes. So as a born-again Christian, believer, I have chosen to believe Jehovah's words that tell me that the sinless Jesus, Yeshua, died in my place for my past sins and then on the third day he rose again as victor over death and sin and everything else. Only because of what Yeshua did on the cross was God able to offer me forgiveness for my sins. I believed these truths and I received with all my heart that I am forgiven. The instant I believe Jehovah's words, my spirit, or as the Bible often refers to as my heart, was made clean from sin. And so it was that part of me, my spirit or my heart, which was born again. The other two parts of me, my sinful flesh or human nature and my soul, consisting mainly of my will, my emotions and my feelings, were not born again. Only my spirit or my heart was made new. And we read that in Ezekiel 36, 26, where, he, where it says, I, Jehovah, will give you a new heart and hence put a new spirit within you. So Yeshua was now my saviour. But he wanted to become my Lord. Therefore, it was essential for me to let him become my Lord if I wanted to move through the cross into all that he had for me. Mind you, you can put your name in here. This simply means that Yeshua was to have complete and total rule over my life, which required from me a conscious, irrevocable or permanent decision on my part that my will or my soul, which was the old man, the human nature that had been ruled by Satan, 
no longer would rule and reign in my life. And so at that point, my allegiance changed to Jehovah as I willingly died to the selfish desires and chose to obey him in all things. That is still a work in progress, by the way. It was at that point of committing my life totally to Jehovah that he became my Lord. And God's Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, entered and took up residency in my life and filled my spirit. To be filled with the Spirit of God simply means to be under the direct influence and control of Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit whilst being wonderful is just that, filled. And I liken it to filling the car with petrol. The car's filled, but nothing happens unless I turn it on and take control of the steering wheel to go somewhere. It's only then that the filling is of any real benefit. Yes, I made a decision to allow the filling to happen. But Jehovah doesn't want me to stop there and he doesn't want you to stop there either. He doesn't want us just to be filled with his spirit but not allowing him to lead us in our direction and our walk. Jehovah wants me to share in all he has for me. But he, I can't do that. He won't allow that unless I let him to his Holy Spirit lead me. So in 1 Peter 1.23 it says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Jehovah wants us to have the whole not just part of what is available through him. And after all, doesn't he own the resources? Isn't he creator of all? Luke eleven thirteen. If you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There comes that word that we don't like, ask. What about Romans 8, 9 to 13? You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. <coughs> but, if the, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, dwell, the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you now. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's not you may, it is you will So a big question we need to ask is where does the Holy Spirit reside within me now that I have Jehovah as my Lord and my Saviour and thus I have the Spirit of God living within me. It's a great question. Have you ever asked it? Have you ever wondered? Because if you asked many believers, they would say, within my heart but it's not correct, as we'll see from the following scriptures. John 7, 38 to 39. 
Whoever believes in me also, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive. For as yet the spirit hadn't been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. But when we look at 1 Peter, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. And that's in the King James, which mean, and the loins mean the procreative part of you. But if we read it in the ESV, it says, therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And Galatians 4, 19, I am going through labour pains in my spiritual womb for you again. Our spirit resides in the lower part of our abdomen, in the vicinity, the Bible indicates, of our belly, loins or womb. The world has unknowingly long been aware of this when it often asks people, what does your gut say? In other words, what does your spirit say? It's the same as what does your conscience say? Because conscience is the voice of our spirit. Something to think about, isn't it? I remember nursing. <coughs> and we used to call it the sixth sense. And I could walk past the kid and I'd stop because I'd just get this sense within. That's the Spirit of God saying, stop and look. Stop and see what's going on here because something's going on. What are the evidence that the Holy Spirit is leading or communicating with my spirit? Well, in my research, the leading of the spirit is described by mature Christians as a prompting, an impression or an inspiration. But the Bible describes it as receiving a desire, an inward witness or work of God at the gut level as to what his will is for me. I believe that's what happened with Paul when he was going to go to one town and God said, no. You're not to go to Asia. You go elsewhere. How about when you go to go somewhere and you think, I'm going to go this route and you get a prompting and God says, no, go this way. What about when, we, when we're somewhere and God says, linger? I call it loitering with intent. What's the intention? To know what God is wanting to do. Maybe with the person that's passing by. Or the person that, that just happens to come up, as did with Pastor Rob the other week, someone who just came up to him in the, while he was having a coffee. What do we call that? But together with this awareness of what God wants me to do, there's actually a desire in my heart to actually do it. because it's imparted to me by God. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's always when I'm in a hurry. And God will say, hold on a minute, and I'll go, okay. 
I don't even get the word but anymore. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> I say, okay. I find it interesting that the Bible describes it as receiving a desire, an inward witness, a work of God at the gut level. The power of the Holy Spirit. When we speak of the power of the Holy Spirit, we are referring to the divine energy and authority that God has given to us. This power is not something that we possess on our own, but it is a gift from God. You know, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Didn't we sing about that? Didn't we read that? It's the same power that parted the Red Sea. It's the same power that created the universe. This power is not meant to be kept hidden or unused, but it is given to us so that we can walk in and live a life that is victorious and impactful to the advancing of Jehovah's kingdom and the pushing back of Satan and his cohorts here on earth. Who wants to see Satan and his cohorts flee just because you're walking along the street? The time is coming. But we've got to be led by the Spirit. Otherwise, we will be teared apart. So don't try and do any of this in your own strength. Please. I truly believe... 100% the following statements. The power of the Holy Spirit is transformative. Why? Because it changes us from inside out. The dunamis power of the Holy Spirit takes our brokenness, our weakness and our failures and it turns them into strengths. It takes our fears and our doubts and turns them into faith and confidence. It takes our sins and our mistakes and it turns them into opportunities for growth, learning and maturing in our relationship with Jehovah and our understanding of his kingdom. This transformative power is not something that we can achieve on our own. How many of us, if we're truthful, have tried? I don't think anyone in this room would not have tried themselves. But it is the work of the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKadosh, within us. As I said, how many times have we tried unsuccessfully to change in our own strength? Yes, we may see glimpses of change, but ultimately for the transformational change that I'm talking about here, it takes a huge amount of time. And we flounder. And when we start to flounder, we give up because we can't sustain the time and the effort in our own strength for the changes to occur. But the Holy Spirit doesn't give up. And in these end days, the Holy Spirit's moving quicker in transforming us into his likeness and image. The power of the Holy Spirit is also enabling. It equips equips us with the abilities and the resources that we need to fulfil God's promises for our lives. It is he who gives us the wisdom to make the right decisions, the courage to stand up for what is right and the strength to persevere in the face of adversity. How many times in our trials do we start to get weaker when we're doing it in our own strength. And I'm not saying that when you go through a trial 
that you're going to be absolutely strong all the time. But all you need to do is ask. And he's back there. He's saying, come on, get up, get going, stand. And when all else fails, stand. And he fills us. It gives us the ability to love unconditionally, to forgive unreservedly and to serve selfishly. Selflessly, not selfishly. <laughs> Whoops, slip of the tongue. Come on, guys, you should be awake and picking me up on it. So, to serve selflessly. This enabling power is not something that we can generate on our own, but is the result of Ruach HaKodesh's work in, in and through us. And I'm so glad that he's here and he's in me and he's in you. This one we don't like. The power of the Holy Spirit is also convicting It confronts us with the truth about ourselves and about our relationship with God. It reveals to us our sins and our need for repentance. He challenges us to turn away from our sinful ways and to turn back towards God. He pushes us to pursue Jehovah's holiness and righteousness that he desires us to walk in. Remember, it's not ours. It's his. And this convicting power is not something that we can ignore or resist, but it is the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. I spend more time on my knees the closer I want to get to him. Does it mean it doesn't, I don't go, ouch? Well, I certainly do. But again, Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, I'm asking that you will lead me into the holiness and the righteousness and right living. What about the guidance of the Holy Spirit? We've done a little bit of it, haven't we? But as believers, we are not left to navigate the complexities of life on our own. Praise God for that. And this is evidenced in today's world where we try to fade, or we try a fad, and that fad according to, to so-and-so of the experts is, is the answer. Do this and this will happen. Or you don't need to discipline your children. Is a big one. Isn't it? And how many times do I hear at school? But I've got rights. Hmm, and so do I. But what's lacking? with these so-called experts and these fads. There's no respect for law. There's no respect for order. There's no respect for family. And there's no respect for self or others. It's a world of give me or I'll take it. It's a world of I'm entitled to. I see it sadly playing out in our children and in the school and the wider community every single day, in every war, every world event where people seek after money, power and authority for selfish gain at the expense of others. What about the numbers of crimes, the breaking in 
of youth gangs. And when I say youth, some of them are as young as nine and ten. The breakdown, because we've, the world started to listen to the experts. I only know one expert, and his name is Jehovah. Most Christians today have no question as to whether or not the Holy Spirit led the heroes of the Bible. But they may have become a bit suspicious when they hear someone in the present day say that the Holy Spirit led them to do this and not do that. When I left my career in nursing, I was told I was foolish and out of my mind. Well, not in those words, but that's exactly what they meant. Words, I think, were, you're crazy. Why would I leave a well-paid permanent position in senior management for less pay and less security? And when I said it was because God told me, there were sneers. And you've got to be joking. Yet the text before us says... those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. That means that as we are led by the Spirit, we show ourselves to be the sons of God. There is also the implication that we have become the sons of by means of the Holy Spirit's leadership because we're allowing him to lead. We're allowing him in our, in our lives, in our innermost being. We are asking of him for the wisdom, for the direction, for the way forward. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And don't let anyone else try and tell you anything different. What are some examples of his leading in scripture? The Bible was filled with examples of people being led by the Spirit of God. It was a common occurrence for such people as David, Elijah, Elisha, many others. Jesus was certainly led by the Spirit because in Matthew 4.1, it says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Well, I don't know whether I like that one. Other than it also meant that he was strengthened by the Spirit. And he came out full of the Spirit. As our example, Jesus depended on the Father for everything he did upon this earth. And the Father led him by the Holy Spirit, just as he led others and he leads us today, if we allow him. Acts five, uh, 8, 5 and 6 tells us that Philip was preaching in Samaria, which was a wonderful thing to do. Because there had been a long-standing prejudice against the Samaritans. But God intended the gospel to get to them and so we read of Philip. In John 4, it records that Jesus purposefully went through Samaria in order to give living water to the woman at the well. She, in turn, went and told the men of the city and the whole, and the whole bunch came out and believed in Christ. Philip was preaching in Samaria and had, was having good success. But in Acts 826 it says an angel of the Lord spoke to him and told him to go down a desert road. How bizarre. Do we realize that angels are ministering spirits? Whose spirit do they minister? The Holy Spirit, God, Jehovah. Anyway, back to Philip, he obeyed and as a result he led the Ethiopian official 
to the Lord and immediately after baptising him, in verse 39, it says, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. Does that mean it was a magical disappearance? No, I don't believe so. It simply means that the spirit told Philip it's time to go. So just like he had come up to the man's chariot, he left. The job was done. The point is the spirit told him to go and he went. And in Acts 16, 7, verses 7 and 8, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit forbade Paul to preach the word in Asia, then permitted him to, to go into Bethania. Now, there's nothing wrong with preaching in those regions. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach to every creature. So there was nothing wrong with preaching there. The thing was, God had somewhere else he wanted Paul to go. So he led him by the Spirit to the place he wanted him to be in. And this wasn't the appointed time for him to preach in Asia. What about the leading of his, his oh, the experience of his leading? Does God still lead people today by the leading of his spirit? The only way that we could rightfully say no would to have would be to have some scriptures telling us that he doesn't. Do you know any of such scriptures? Because I don't. I went looking, couldn't find anything. However, I want to bring to your attention 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. And these verses speak of some things that will be done away with when that which is perfect is come. <coughs> some well-meaning yet misguided people have interpreted that to mean when the writing of the Bible is completed. But if we look at the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 and if we look at the chapter before and the chapter after, you will have to conclude that nowhere is this the writing of the Bible being talked about. So it's not done away with. He still leads today. He still speaks to his people today. And verse 12 makes it clear. When we are going to understand everything clearly and when we are going to know everything completely. When is that going to be? It's going to be when we get to heaven because we're always going to have questions. So in 1 Corinthians 13, it's telling us that when we get to heaven, these spiritual gifts aren't going to be needed then. But until then, they are needed. They are essential. I'll go past needed. They're essential. And so it's not saying that some of the spiritual things are going to end when the Bible is completely written. Now, let me very quickly say that some of the practical reason for this is that we have the witness of the word of God by many believers. And Jesus said to Thomas in John 20, 29, Blessed are those who have not yet seen, yet have believed. That's faith in action. So in my journey, there was no scripture that would indicate that God no longer leads his people by his spirit. You've been led by the Holy Spirit if you are a Christian. Here's the way it progresses. The Holy Spirit illuminates the word of God to your understanding. You may have read it for yourself, heard it from a preacher or teacher or even through the words of some of our songs. Or the Lord himself has spoken the word audibly through a vision, a dream or prophetically. But by some means... It came to you. 
and the Spirit illuminated it to your understanding. That's revelation. Then the Holy Spirit led you to make a judgment of your life against the Word of God and you were weighed in God's balance and found wanting. You saw that you came short of the glory of God and the Holy Spirit led you to feel conviction because of your sin. And then finally the Holy Spirit led you to understand that Jesus was the perfect, sinless Son of God and that God himself, Jehovah, sacrificed him on the cross for your sins and following the Holy Spirit's leading, you turn to God with a repentant heart through faith in Christ Jesus. And God saved you, beginning a good work in you that he will perform to the day of the Lord. That's why we sing it's all about him, isn't it? Yes, we've got to respond, but he's the one who made the path. That's why we celebrate communion. That's a reminder of what he has done. The expectation of his leading. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, you can expect to be led into deeper understanding of the word of God. And in John 16, 13, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. And in John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to the Father and said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So you can expect to be led to and into God's word. You can expect the Holy Spirit to lead you to put to death the works of the flesh. That is doing of those things that your natural senses tell you that are contrary to the word of God. Romans 8.12 says that we have a debt, but it's not to the flesh. His leading will always be consistent with the word of God and the character of God. Here's another one we don't like. You can expect the Holy Spirit to lead you out of your comfort zone. Ooh, don't know whether I like that one. But I hate to tell you that that's a given. Why? Because in our comfort zone, we're comfortable. There's no stretching, there's no refining, there's no maturing. But following him is a step of faith and a walk of faith. I say it that way because a walk begins with a step. There's always a first step. It's hardly ever comfortable at first. It may not be comfortable, but it is glorious. It brings a joy, a peace and satisfaction into your life that most people will never know about who don't know him. Think of Paul. I am happy when I've got little. I am happy when I've got much. How happy are we? When are we happy? When are we happy? Well, even get rid of the word happy. When are we joyful? When we're walking with him. I've seen this in action. Soon after my parents went into the ministry, money was really tight. My dad used to be a chef. Worked strange hours, but got paid reasonably. Ministry wasn't so forthcoming. So time and time again, they had bills that were due and no money to pay them with. Dad gave away his last can of food. We had to someone in need. That was literally, that literally left us with nothing to eat ourselves. And that was four kids, mum and dad. Dad gave it away. Because they had need. What a funny thing to do. Yet I believe my father prayed similar words to these. Lord, I'm yours and I'm doing what I'm doing because you led me to do it. So I'm turning this thing over to you. 
And I'm not sure who the people were, but people came and asked if they could come over. And in each instance they said, God told me to give you this money or here's some food for you. And without hesitation they handed over the exact amount of money or enough produce for mum to make a meal. So dad would take it and thank them for their obedience. And we never went without what we needed. And to this day, it's still the same. When you and I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, God is going to bless us and he is going to bless others through us. Maybe at times it's not the way we think, but we can never outgive our God who is faithful and true. And I think most of us can testify to that, can't we? Amen. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, loving him and his will, and he shall give you, place his desires in you to become the desires of your heart. 1 John 5.10 Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And Philippians 2.13 For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. The inward witness of God's spirit to my spirit directing my path is God's still small voice most of the time. But it can be through visions. It can be through prophetic words. It can be through dreams. At all times, God wants to tell me in my heart what I should do. But if I harden my heart as a result of sin, my spiritual ears become dull of hearing so that I won't hear God's voice. God more often than not will also confirm the word he has given me, be it through a prophetic word, preaching, teaching, a dream, vision, a song or peace within. But if I harden my heart and I don't listen, he won't speak. And I want to finish with a scripture and word from Andrew Murray. And it's Ephesians, well, a couple of them actually. It's Ephesians 5.18. And it's part B of that verse which says, instead be filled once, no, continually with the Holy Spirit. And Andrew Murray said this, this is the one thing needed for the church, the thing which above all others men ought everywhere to seek for with one accord and with their whole heart is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And I've added, and then allow him to lead us in every step we take. One John two six. He who says he, says he abides or lives in him Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. God says I must, and so I can live the same way Jesus did. Jesus was always led by the Holy Spirit, and to be children of God, you and I must be too. Amen. Amen. I just think about what's happening, what's happening in the world at the moment. And I've shed quite a few tears. But in the midst of that, God says, let me lead you. My path might be narrow and not many people will travel it. 
But if you allow me to, if you allow me to use you, if you allow me to direct you, if you allow me to speak into you instead of the world, then there's going to be greater opportunities to reach more people. And you're going to be amazed at what I do. Don't be troubled by what you see. Your confidence, your focus needs to be in Jehovah and only him. And so whilst I'm saddened, because I don't like see, seeing anyone any innocent people die. I actually don't even like to see the soldiers die. But we're in a fallen world, people. But greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And he's saying to each and every one of us, rise up, let me lead you, and you will be amazed. Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you for the leading of Ruach HaKadosh. And as we reflect on what you have been saying to each of us in our heart, in our minds, but more importantly in our innermost beings, in our spirit. Lord, I thank you that each of us want to rise up and be the people that you have called us and you have planned for us to be. The people who are unwavering, the people who want to love with your unconditional love those that are hard to love at times. To be your hands and feet, to show the world that you are alive and well that you love them so much that you died for them and then you rose again in victory. And I thank you that as we stand with you and co-labour with you and move with you and are led by your spirit, we will see the enemy pushed back. In fact, we will see him run as we approach, as we walk, as we talk, as we drive. We will see him just go. We will see the healings. We will see the miracles. We will see the signs and wonders that are for the benefit of others who don't know you. And we thank you, Lord, for the harvest that is coming in. We thank you for the fact that this place, as we have prayed many times, especially on soaking nights, that this place will be filled to overflowing. But you already have the new place for us. And so we thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You guide us, you lead us every step of the way as we align ourselves and realign ourselves and, and our allegiance is to you. And may you receive the glory, honour and the praise. Amen.